Well, it is November. I think this is the first time we've ever done a sweater vest dialogue during November. So I'm I I guess my first question uh, to you, Doug, has to be: uh, Is the sweater vest that you're wearing filled with asbestos? <laughs> it is not. It is no. not. Okay, I, because uh, I'm I'm a little concerned that 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 there could be flames and smoke and and stuff like that because it's November. But we're gonna. Are you, I, I have. No. I seriously are concerned for you, brother. I really am. <laughs> Well, th thank you. Are those uh, weird sweater vests? That, are those flammable? Um, those I'm, I'm sure that I'm sure they probably are actually. So you'll, you've yeah. never seen me uh, doing anything near fire. All right. Nope. Nope. So and and we're not 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 planning on doing that. I'm going to leave that up to you. And okay. uh, it is it is no quarter November. So uh, our conversation because. Uh, I got contact and said, "Hey, we we need to do another sweater vest dialogue." And I said, "Sure, on what?" And he said, "Christian nationalism." And I'm like, "Uh oh, what did I say? <laughs> what have you been told that I made a comment or anything, uh, or or is this just sort of we're flying by the seat of our pants?" Uh, mostly by the seat of our pants. Okay, I heard you. I I haven't heard anything specific that you said or didn't say. Okay. Um, but I but I heard that you may have said something. <laughs> well, it's sort of hard not to say something these days. Well, well, of course, yes. I I think Silent. what I I think what I said that may have triggered this was I just briefly in passing said uh, Christendom without Christ is dumb because you took Christ out of Christendom. It was sort of a little bit of a pun, uh, but it was. And we're, we need, we do need to get into it. Um, uh, you said on your you did a dialogue with uh, uh, is it Doctor Wolf? I'm not even sure. Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. With Doctor Wolf, yeah. um, you said that you're working on a uh, book called Mere Christendom. Is that is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. So I've heard you talk about that uh, a number of times before, and maybe what people are thinking about is the fact that. For many years, I have opposed um, what I've called mere Christianity, not the book by C.S. Lewis, right. but the movement that I've seen primarily in apologetic circles that fundamentally says that we, we have enough for Christianity to exist if we can just get everybody to agree on the Trinity— and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. In other words, we're never going to get everybody to agree on the gospel, so that has become a side issue. It's not definitional of the faith. And I have just basically said, uh, I'm a good Vantillian, and I, I, I think that Dr. Vantill would have uh, objected, and so I'll object too. Uh, yeah. I don't think that's enough to actually define the Christian faith, it's certainly not on the basis of the New Testament. We wouldn't need the book of Galatians if that was the case. So right. I've, I've said that, and I've heard your discussions about how you're defining Christendom, but now we right. have Christian nationalism. And yes. even the title of, the, of what, you got, what you guys posted, just I think just a couple of days ago, I, I listened to it on the Canon app, was... Christian nationalism versus uh, Christendom, question mark, or something like that. But I didn't really hear a lot of discussion of, do you think there's a difference between the two? Because, I mean, you're sort of, this is all a matter of definitions, it, it seems to me, right? right? I, I don't remember the exact headline, but I think it might have been Christian nationalism versus mere Christendom, question mark. Right. Right, right. So uh, what's, what is the difference, if any— between what Wolf is arguing for and what I'm arguing for. And, um, and what I'm arguing for is a sort of a larger scale uh, project. So he's talking about Christian nationalism with a uh, focus on America, right? He, but what, what he's saying applies to other nations. But my take on mere Christendom uh, is more post-millennial and exuberant where I want us to be talking about world evangelization and many nations um, being part of a consortium of, of believing nations. And, uh, but the mere, so the mere Christendom 
is to is intended to keep it from fracturing into denominational camps where you have the um, where it's thought to be sort of Lutheranism. Here's a Lutheran state. Here's an Anglican state. Um, what I'm talking about is uh, a a core commitment of what distinguishes a Christian nation from a Buddhist nation or or an Islamic nation. And I'm wanting to stay out of denominational issues, right? So that means I'm against an established church, all right? So, all right, so, uh, which I think would uh, allay, allay all the reasonable concerns of sensible Baptists, among whom I, I reckon you being one, <laughs> all right? So um, I, I believe that the, the model ought to be a, a nation that's formally Christian, but not attached to a particular ecclesiastical structure. Okay. Would, would, uh, I'm sure you've you've uh, read uh, Mission of God by Joe Boot, um, and I, if my recollection was he was actually quoting primarily from Rush Dooney, but he talked about a a form of Christian libertarianism uh, that was sort of based upon the major uh, conversion of of people that bring about the form of unity rather than an externally enforced type of Correct. unity. Um, so, I mean, that makes sense Correct. with within a post-millennial context where you're talking about a major work of the Spirit, you know, the nations, you know, streaming into Jerusalem, so on and so forth. That makes sense in that context, but it really, where I think, I think a lot of people are struggling is how it makes sense in our current context, given yeah. that nation, you know, entire states like Vermont and California uh, just uh, you know, passed abortion laws that make Roe v. Wade look like child's play, or was it Nebraska or North Dakota that? What was it? Oh, Montana, Montana, Montana. You guys are right next door. What were you guys doing up there? Um, uh, <laughs> Montana, you know, defeating uh, an initiative to to just not allow babies to to suffer and die on a on a cold metal table. Uh, it, right. it, it, you know, I'm looking around at, at Gen Z and I'm not seeing the fulfillment of the post-millennial hope quite yet. So, yeah. so how, if, how does that so work? If you, uh, here's the thing. If someone said, uh, I want you to incorporate Vermont or California into this Christendom of yours, uh, by the end of this week. Okay. Uh, I would say it's not going to happen. That's not how this is going to happen because the only the only way that somebody might think to attempt it would be through a top-down imposition, right? You know, um, and and if you had that, it would be like uh, Josiah's Reformation, where a bunch of good things are done top-down, but then as soon as Josiah is dead, the people veer off into into idolatry again. So what I'm talking about rides on the back of Reformation and revival. So it's what, Fran it's what Francis Schaeffer used to call um, a Christian consensus. Uh, so there's a, there's a Christian consensus, which is only possible because a massive amount of the people have been converted. And then they influence those nominal Christians adjacent to them. And then there are people who oppose, but the people who oppose are, are on the periphery now because there's a massive Christian consensus. Now, I, th I think that America had that kind of informal establishment in the 19th century, okay? So um, there, was in, there was actually a Supreme Court decision in 1892 that was, uh, uh, ironically, the name of the case was Holy Trinity versus the United States uh, of America. And... <laughs> the, and and so what happened was there there was a law that forbade the hiring of um, foreigners, and there was a church I think in New York, Holy Trinity Church, which hired a Brit minister. Okay, so so they hired a foreigner contrary to the law, and uh, some prosecutor brought the case, and so it was Holy Trinity the church with a Brit minister here uh, against 
uh, the United States. The case went all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court struck down the prohibition of hiring this Brit minister on the one hand, and then they went on to explain that the reason they were doing this is because this was a Christian nation. But they made the decision, it's a formal decision by the Supreme Court, and, but they went back to Christopher Columbus, the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut, and, and then they said, this is a, a Christian nation, not because we're attached to any denomination or because there's a particular ecclesiastical structure that's supported by taxes. All right, it's not that. All right, so, but that was only possible because there was a massive Christian consensus at, at the time. And the only way we're going to get back to any such consensus is through a massive work of the Spirit. All right, if, if, if there is such a work, and let's say, let's say 75% of the nation became convinced and practicing Christians, there's, there's no conceivable way to keep that from coming out in the laws. Right, it's uh, it, it's going to happen. So just as currently, if you're in a corporation now and you're thinking of standing up at a at a an employees meeting and saying, you know, I don't think boys should marry boys. I don't I don't think that um, we should have these trans surgeries. There is a consensus that's going to run you out of town. Right, it, it's a even though um, th that's not massively. Um, imposed through force of law in all 50 states, there is a secularist consensus currently that everybody who wants to say anything has to reckon with before they say it. Well, there have been times in America's history where we've had that kind of consensus only as uh, it was a Christian consensus. And I think when that happens, I would like to see the Apostles' Creed in the Constitution, but I'm, a, I'm an anti-establishmentarian. I don't think that we ought to have a Church of the United States. Now, because, uh, well, I should say, there's, there's something else I should say here. Uh, when the Constitution was adopted, um, nine of the 13 states had an official relationship with a particular denomination. Now, I'm, a, I'm against even that. So I wouldn't want the CREC, my denomination, to be the official denomination of Idaho. All right, I, I would be opposed to that. If it came up at our presbytery meeting or at our council meeting, I'd vote against it. I now, think now, now, a, now, wait a minute. Uh, now, now, Doug, now, Doug I've, I've read on websites that actually you are trying to become king of Idaho. So I'm really not sure about, you know, I, are you sure about this? Because there are <laughs> yes, people I'm, out there. Now, they're anonymous, so they won't tell us what their names are, but they, they have testified uh, in, in clearly, uh, clearly that, that you're seeking to become king of Idaho. Yeah, clearly, being anonymous, they have an inside track. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, it's a, it's just, it's just you know when you, I, here I interrupted you. You're going along so well. I'm agreeing yeah. with you, and then it's like, hey, got to got to mention all the uh, all the fun folks out there. But so you don't want you're not trying to become king of Idaho. You don't want the CREC to become the, the not, official denomination. Yeah, because right. yeah. But but I I will say this if. Uh, let's say I uh, my debates my de my debating skills have waned, and I my uh, opposition to this um, is overcome at council, and and my denomination becomes the official denomination of Idaho. If that were to happen, number one, it'd be the kiss of death for the CREC. It's just it's just a bad thing for the church. Um, it's just not good, not healthy. But the second thing I would want to say is even though it's a bad idea, it's not an unconstitutional idea. Right. Okay. Because the, at the time the constitution was adopted, the founders didn't want a church of the United States because that would collide because let's say it was the Anglican church. They, that would collide with the fact that the congregational church was the church of Connecticut. Uh, so if you if we have a national bird and a state bird, no, they're likely not going to be any wars over that. Or a national flower and a and a state flower, we're going to be okay. But if you have the Anglicans at the national level and the Congregationalists at the uh, uh, at the at the Connecticut level and Anglicans again at the South Carolinian level, if you have that, you're just setting yourself up for strife. And so 
since we were a federal um, republic, we said no national church. Congress shall make no law concerning the establishment of religion. So that means Congress is the only entity that could could violate the First Amendment. <laughs> Congress shall make no law, right? Uh, but Connecticut could have an official religion and did down to the 1830s. So it wasn't unconstitutional. And the, the thing that's really striking to me is that on the same day, the, the same day that the uh, Congress ratified the final language of the First Amendment, on that same day, they proclaimed a national day of thanksgiving and prayer. <laughs> okay? They wanted, they wanted everybody in the country to give thanks to Almighty God, um, and they, they passed that measure on the same day, on the same day that they uh, finalized the language of the First Amendment. That tells you that they were not opposed to recognizing God. They were not opposed to Christian morality being recognized by consensus. They just didn't want a formal state church at the federal level. And neither do I. But they were white, cisgendered, misogynist uh, slave owners, right? I mean, so yeah. why should we even dig mm -hmm. into that kind of stuff anymore? Mm -hmm. and, and I say that and we both go, yeah, right. Yeah. But unfortunately, those are the people voting today. They really do think that way. Let me, th let me throw in a, a, a thought experiment for you. John, there's a, a secular liberal uh, legal theorist, John Rawls, who said you, when you design your ideal society, you should design it not knowing where you, you are going to be born into it. Okay? Um, you should, and that means, in his thinking, it's going to be uh, not a, a, a society with gross inequities. Right. Um, uh, it's because you want, you want it to be sort of equitable and fair-minded. Well, that, that's just simply applying the golden rule to your thought experiments. But if we said these cisgendered white heterosexual men who um, made this deal with the, the slave owners in the South and brought together this um, more perfect union, but still an imperfect union because of things like that, even with that said, it would be far better if, if I were a black man deciding where to be born. Do I want to be born in 1858 in Charleston or in 2022 in New York City? Do I want to be conceived in 1858 Charleston or in New York City in our, our era? Well, my chances are, of survival would be much better, much stronger in Charleston. Okay. The, yeah. Well, the, the, that's the point. Uh, we, we chop up black babies into pieces and we sell the pieces, right? And we do this while feeling morally superior to the owners of the Charleston slave market, which shows you how, how blinded sin can make you. And this is not a defense of the Charleston slave market. It's just saying you guys, you guys don't understand the difference between weightier matters of the law and the lesser matters of the law. Um, our, our situation is so much more unspeakably wicked than what was going on back there, and we pull it off with a sense of moral superiority. And we then enshrine it in, uh, in law uh, when we have the opportunity to do so. So, um, so would, would it be fair to say, do, do you, are there any specific... Uh, concerns you have with the current Christian nationalism movement as a whole. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. W w I mean, people are going to be shocked that Can Impress might actually publish books with different perspectives in them. Uh, <laughs> right. I, was, I was showing Rich this morning, I, I brought up the app, and um, by the way, I, I just want to let you know that I'm a full paying subscriber. I was offered, I was offered the free ride, but it only worked for like two weeks. <laughs> and then I just said, <laughs> ah, whatever, I'll just go for the whole thing. So, so I'm a full paying subscriber there. Uh, but I was showing him and I scrolled down to for men and uh, I was about the fourth or fifth person in, in the, in the, you know, when you s scroll over to that one and then yeah. down under baptism, you not only we not only had um, the debate that you and I did, but we also had someone had posted the debate I did with Greg Strawbridge, 
uh, yeah. as well. So I'm like, hey, you, you got it. You got to give them props for uh, putting up, putting it all out there. Uh, uh, that's really cool. So, uh, do you have any criticisms for the 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 either the book or the movement? Um, yeah. Um, so. Uh, with the book, Stephen Wolf has been here uh, visiting us, and I've uh, met with him. I believe that he is a responsible, sane uh, guy arguing his case, and I think his case needs to be taken seriously. And he says a bunch of things that just really delight me. But he's a Thomist, for example, and I'm not a Thomist. Um, he he uh, he has a, um, he would not adet- he would not call himself any kind of reconstructionist or theonomist, he would be more in the historic magisterial reformation stream. There'd be, there are things to differ with and talk about and, and discuss, which I I'm happy to do with him. Uh, but his, um, his book is just really wonderful. It's got a lot of really good things in it and I can read it and appreciate this and differ with that and learn something momentous here and disagree with some other element. That's not the thing that matters to me and to us is when we're talking about Christian nationalism, we don't want to publish anything from the fever swamps. All right. There, there are Christian nationalist fever swamps. Um, there are people who would say, well, the Nazis weren't that bad. They got some things right. (laughs) Or, or there, there are people, um, you know, Ku Kluxers or uh, hard kinists or, you know, that sort of thing. And what what Wolf is doing is he's saying the natural affection that you have for your own kids and your own family and your own place and your own people is a God-given good thing. And of course, in a fallen world, it can get swollen and disordered and veer off into uh, different kinds of jingoism or, you know, it, it can... And there are elements of that. There are people out there calling themselves Christian nationalists who uh, who are doing those sorts of worrisome things. The right. So I uh, just my blog post this morning. I, I wanted to make it very clear that we're having nothing to do with any of that kind of stuff. But it, there are th- those same people are going to be uh, claiming to be patriotic claiming to be red state Americans, claiming to be, um, you know, things that other mainstream Americans don't have any problem with, right? Well, I'm, yeah, I'm a patriotic red state American, red meat, red state. Yeah, okay. Um, well, doesn't it trouble you Trouble you that Christian nationalists also wave the flag? Uh, I don't think we should be uh, consumed with... Uh, guilt by association, just so long as it's very clear that w- where we stand. So this is something I, I, in the, I've already turned the manuscript in on mere Christendom. And one of the, one of the chapters, one of the sections is something I previously posted uh, on my blog, which was the whole issue of the Jesus mobs. Uh, in first century Palestine, there were a whole bunch of crowds, surly crowds, who uh, were quite capable of killing Pharisees you know, uh, in the book of Acts. When they arrested the apostles who had gotten out of the prison, they did so gingerly, for they feared the mob, right? Uh, the, the, the people who railroaded Jesus, the reason they had their, his trial in the middle of the night was they feared the crowds. They feared the crowds. Well, the crowds that they were fearing were people who clearly had not grasped the full import of the Sermon on the Mount, right? But Jesus, Jesus doesn't uh, apologize for them, for the existence of those mobs. He doesn't apologize them of, for them, not even once. He, he uses them as a foil. Uh, there's a crowd standing over there, and they say, what authority you, uh, are you using? And Jesus said, well, I'll tell you what authority I do this under. If you answer this question for me, was John the Baptist's baptism from heaven or not? Well, they, they reason among themselves, if we say that a John the Baptist baptism was not of God, the crowd over there is going to kill us. <laughs> They're going to come, come after us. And if we say it was from heaven, then Jesus is going to say, well, so why weren't you baptized by, by him? 
right? So Jesus used those people as part of a pincher movement. Uh, he didn't apologize. He didn't issue a press release saying, uh, we would like to denounce in the most firm tones the unconscionable threats that have been made against Ananias and uh, Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I, so it seems to me as, and I'm not, I'm not claiming to be an expert on these things, what do you, why do you think this has become so much of a topic only since COVID? I mean, we weren't really, you know, I, I'm sure there were people talking about certain aspects of this and always have been. It's it's a generational thing. But all of a sudden, I don't know where the term Christian nationalism came from, but that was not a normal part of our vocabulary um, no, well, for my life. That's for sure. So uh, one of the things that Stephen Wolf does in his book that's very helpful is he um, he gives a over overview of the history of the term Christian nationalism. And in days gone by, it was much more of a vanilla term, not controversial, but it was not controversial because it was used back in the day when there was much more of a Christian consensus. In in recent years, I think it has gotten it, it has become something of a hot property because of how some people in MAGA world or Trump world have been using it. And some of them are using it in a reasonable way. And some of them are using it in ways that are sort of a fringe element uh, kind of way. And what this book does is it, it shows that this is a, um, a responsible position taken by responsible people who are not uh, kooks. So, so basically, P.G. Woodhouse once said, whenever you have any group of people, uh, one part of them are always up to something. And he said, the rest of them, the rest of them are up to something else. <laughs> so, so, so that's something we, we do have to uh, factor in. If, uh, if Christian, nobody is trying to uh, restore or refurbish the term white supremacist, right? That because that that's got the toxin, that's got the poison right in the term, right? You don't want to have any you don't want to have anything to do with that. But Christian nationalism is something that is only racist because the progressives say that it is. Uh, and and so we but we don't believe what they say anymore. And so the reason I think this ultimately this the, the reason this book is selling very well which it, which it is doing. Uh, the reason this is a hot topic of discussion is because the secular liberal order has, over the last two years, utterly discredited themselves. The, there are all sorts of people who used to give the establishment the benefit of the doubt. One of the things that um, middle-of-the-road Christians, the kind of people who worship on Sunday and go to their job and work faithfully at their job, uh, they would say, okay, the medical establishment, the health establishment has our best interest in mind. The, uh, the military has our best interest in mind. They're out there protecting our freedoms. Uh, and then the last two years has revealed that the establishment does not have our best interest in mind, and they are doing all kinds of demented and cockamamie things. And when people who have been saying for decades that we've been saying for decades that the secular liberal establishment is bankrupt, this is all going to come crashing down. Well, 20 years ago, you had to take, somebody could be a farsighted individual and say that, but everybody would look around and everything still looked stable. But the last two years, nothing has looked stable. And so a lot of people, I think, are prepared to hear um, questions that go to the root matter. So we can't name the name of Jesus. Why can't we name the name of Jesus? He's, he's the Savior, isn't he? You know, that's something that you couldn't get an audience for 10 years ago. But if you say, no, it, it needs to be Christian because secularism is bankrupt, I think that, that has traction today. Secularism, uh, as I've said to you before, I think is the greatest enemy that has ever risen against the, the name of Christ. Uh, it is not only bankrupt, but it's also uh, the essence of the culture of death. I, I, I would, everyone would jump on me if I didn't uh, point out one of the texts from the book that has been floating around on the, um, on the interwebs 
uh, that certainly caught my attention. So I'd be interested, especially in light of the debate we did back in 2004, uh, nearly okay. 20 years ago, um, the section on baptism in, um, yeah. in the book um, says, many readers may by now be frustrated that I have not mentioned the issue of baptism. My hope is that my argument so far have appealed to a pan-Protestant audience, but I should say here that paedo-baptism, i.e. infant baptism, is the position most, most natural to Christian nationalism, for baptizing infants brings them outwardly, at least, into the people of God. When the body politic is baptized, all are people of God. All religious expectations are then social expectations, and the socialization of children is the socialization of young Christians. Baptism is both a social and spiritual event, for society treats that child as a full member of their Christian peoplehood. Um, but right. credo baptism likely creates problems for Christian nationalism. It is no accident that Baptists tend to be advocates for near absolute religious liberty, and this is not uh, only due to their tradition of dissent. Their theology of baptism restricts Christian obligation to the credo baptized, and thus the mass of society, at least in people's formative years, do not, in principle, have Christian obligations. It is difficult to see how cultural Christianity, as I've described it, could operate effectively with that theology. Pado baptism is consistent with Christian nationalism because it makes possible a society that is baptized in infancy and thus is subject to Christian demands for all of life. So I read that, and you can imagine it gives me a little bit of the willies, um, especially in light of the fact that I look at Europe today, and I look right. at, at what has happened in Europe and its history, and I go, we already tried this once. And um, right. it, again, without that post-millennial spiritual work that actually creates new hearts, you end up with a society of baptized pagans. Um, right. And that's what you got in the Netherlands today, unfortunately, uh, is a bunch of baptized pagans. And they love their euthanasia and, uh, and their LGBTQ everything and, and everything else because there hasn't been a change of, of, of heart in the process. All right. So let's, let's um, prepare here for perhaps what me, it might be for our viewers something of a surprising little love fest. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> because there, there's par parts of this that uh, what you're saying, I agree with completely. But then I would turn around and say, yeah, but there, so there'd be a little bit of pushback here. One is that I, I, I agreed with Wolf's quotation there. I agreed with it entirely. And he said, this thing that I'm arguing for is a problem for Baptists. And I agree with that also, but I don't think it was an, it's an insoluble problem for Baptists. Okay? I, I think this is a nut that can be cracked. But I think that Baptists would have to go through one or two extra steps to uh, to deal with this problem. It, it's it's easier and more straightforward in a Presbyterian or an Anglican or a Lutheran place to to be a Christian nation with this with the Lutheran consensus or Presbyterian consensus. That would be more straightforward. Uh, if you had a uh, a Christian consensus that was Baptistic then you've got a conversionist ethic that is uh, being born into that society where a kid's an American, but he's a, let's say it's an overwhelmingly Baptist country, and he's born into the country, but he's not a member of the church. Uh, you know, how would that work? That, that's the problem that he's talking about. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I would say that you can deal with it by pointing to the fact that during the time, I would argue that America was most successfully a Christian nation. It was so at a time when the Baptist ethos was very strong. All right, so, uh, so the, the Baptists were very much included in the time when America had a successful run as a Christian nation, not with a formal establishment, but with the cons that consensus. Now, here's the little bit of pushback. Uh, we we look at uh, we look at Finland and Denmark and Netherlands and you, where you've got a continent of baptized infidels, right? But then we could do we could do the same thing with Alabama, right? In Alabama, everybody's a Christian until they get their driver's license, right? And 
And so what, what happens, I grew up, I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church. And if, uh, and what happens is when you're around, if you're dealing with the 10 year olds, the deacons do a sweep through the Sunday school and it's time to go, it's time for the kids to go forward and the kids go forward and they are baptized. I was baptized when I was 10, uh, went forward and made a profession of faith and, and it was genuine and sincere, but it was something, it's part of the cultural expectation. And so uh, you can have you can have a Baptistic infidel nation, just as you have a, a Pado Baptist infidel nation. So I've long said that the issue for faithfulness and unfaithfulness for a denomination or a local congregation or a nation is not whether or not when you baptize, but whether or not you discipline in terms of your baptism. If if you practice dis- church discipline of kids who were baptized in infancy and grew up in the church, but they start fornicating or getting drunk when they're 17, and if you discipline them, then I don't think you're going to have uh, the same problem that they have in Europe. But if they say, oh, well, boys will be boys, that kind of thing, you're going to have a problem. But you could have the same problem in Baptistic culture as well, where uh, a kid went forward when he was 10, got baptized, and started fornicating and drinking when he got his driver's license, and then no, no discipline. What's happening there is the same thing. Infidelity and apostasy and unfaithfulness is overrunning the church. But it can happen to Baptist cultures as much as Pedobaptist ones. So when, when we, we went over to Germany uh, just before the uh, 500th anniversary of the Reformation, we had a, had a wonderful trip where we went around to various parts of primarily Luther's life, and, and that's when I got to preach in the Castle Church in Wittenberg and uh, talk about a bucket list type of a thing. It, it really, really, yeah. really was. Um, though I'm not sure if I've told you, uh, when I started to preach, there was a little bit of a buzz in the, in the sound system. And uh, it went away eventually. And afterwards, I, I come down the winding stairs. And of course, that, that pulpit is directly over Luther's tomb. He's, he's right there. Okay. And uh, so I told my friends, I said, did you hear that little buzz? I said, yeah, we got, got it taken care of. I said, yeah, that was actually Luther spinning in his grave because a Baptist <laughs> was preaching in his pulpit, uh, which, which there's a lot more to that than, than we might, might, might imagine. Do you know who Fritz Erba was? Fritz, I think I do. Fritz Erba was an Anabaptist, I guess. You know, yeah. I don't like that term because it was, if you can use it of the people of Munster as well as everybody yeah. else, I'm not really sure how useful the term it is. But um, right. Fritz Erba uh, was convinced by reading Luther's translation of the New Testament in German um, of Credo Baptism. And right. he was arrested and placed in prison. Um, he started preaching out of his window and converting people. And so they dragged him up to the Wartburg Castle, um, where, of course, Luther had hid as Junker Jorg and had translated the, the very New Testament that he, that he uh, uh, believed. And they put him in the dungeon in the second of the two spires of the, of the castle. Um, and I, I have a short video, I don't know if you've ever seen it, it's less than five minutes long, that we shot at, at what they called the terror hole, um, because mm-hmm. you were lowered down, you were tied up and you were lowered down through this thing into pitch blackness. There's no windows, there's no doors down there. It's about 40 feet down. And mm. that's where he was imprisoned for six years Man. before he died. And they think they found his, his uh, skeleton in like 2006, I think, something like that. Um, outside the castle walls. And I explained to people, they would have Lutheran ministers that would come and sit up there at that hole and preach down at him about baptism. And Mm -hmm. I'm like, how many of us would have lasted, would have, how many of us would have changed our doctrine of baptism within the week? (laughs) Maybe, maybe faster, even before going through it. Uh, He did not. And he died down there. And the, the problem is Luther knew he was down there and Luther, mm-hmm. Luther felt that he needed to be down there because from Luther's perspective, after, especially after, after Munster, um, there's rebellion, there's anarchy, the, and that, that is a huge fear 
in Luther's mind, especially after 1525 and the, and the peasants were right. So, right. So I had, I had some of the people in my group, you know, come up to me and, and basically say, I, I don't know how I can believe Luther was actually a Christian if he knew that a man who believed his New Testament believed everything else he believed, but on that one issue was in that hole for six years. And Luther agreed right. with that. And my response to him was, you better be very careful because if you make that your standard, there weren't many Christians in history um, right. until the modern, the modern period. I call that sacralism. And one of the things that, that um, I'm not sure if you've seen uh, Joe Boot's recent book, um, Ruler of Kings, but the, the last chapter deals with the, the difference between the kingdom and the church. They right. have to be distinguished from, from one another. But in sacralism, they really end up becoming very much intermingled. And that's where a lot of the problems came from. And I think that's, there's, that's a picture of where that kind of a problem comes from. So if the Baptists have a few extra steps they have to take in quote unquote Christian nationalism, or even in, in your understanding of mere Christendom, um, how do you avoid Fritz Erba's in the future? Yeah. Is, is the only way around that, that you really do have a 75% population that has been regenerated? Was it because there was so much nominalism. I, I mean, yeah. how how do you how do you, how do you deal with that? Yeah. So uh, that the, what you're raising is the central question in all of this. So let's say if you take the let's just postulate that there are five extra steps that a Baptist would have to take to get to the state of affairs. I, as a Presbyterian, would take three of them. All right. So so I think that the the Baptist concerns about not wanting a replay of this sort of thing um, is uh, is right and righteous and good. We have to we have to prevent that sort of thing from happening again. Uh, the, something similar happened with Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry, uh, I think his father was an Anglican and his mother was a Presbyterian, and but uh, and he would he would go. His mother would take him to listen to the preaching of. Um, uh, Samuel Davies, who was a great Presbyterian minister in Virginia at the time. But Patrick Henry, with that background, was outraged at the flogging. There was a Baptist minister in Virginia who was flogged for being a ba for for being a Baptist minister. And he and they didn't have the Anabaptist scare to worry about. He, he was just a what we would think of as a Baptist. And the challenge or the the temptation for uh, Christian nationalism of this sort is that if citizenship and your membership in the, the body of Christ are interchangeable, then what happens when someone pops up, let's say you're, it's a Presbyterian or a Lutheran or a, an Anglican nation, and someone comes in and he's, he forms a Baptist congregation, that's not just a different doctrinal position. That's also an attack on our way of life. That's a, that's un, it's, it becomes unpatriotic, right? The, and, and, and if you're having, if this is happening in the same era when you're dealing with the peasants' revolt or the Munster shenanigans, it becomes people uh, become convinced in their own mind that they're dealing with an existential threat to, to everybody, and then it's not long before Caiaphas says it's it is fitting that one man die for the sake of the people. Right? That that's the so that's the challenge. So I would jump back over to America and say I really like America's version of the uh, of this mere Christendom. In 1789, the first the first uh, General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in America met in 1789, which was the same year that the Constitution was adopted. The General Assembly met in Philadelphia, and the moderator of the General Assembly that was elected was Witherspoon, who had signed the Declaration. And he, So these people are all breathing the same air. The American version of the Westminster, if you read the original British Westminster Confession, when they talk about the civil magistrate, they, they're 
they can uh, veer toward Erastianism. You have to remember that Parliament convened the Westminster Assembly, and uh, they say the civil magistrate has the power to convene a synod, and he has the authority to be present at them and to determine that their findings are in accord with the Word of God. <laughs> right? Uh, and you say, okay, that's a problem. That's a problem. So uh, the American, the first meeting of the Presbyterians in America, basically said that uh, the magistrate is to be a nursing father, as Isaiah talks about, but is to make no distinction between the churches of our common Lord. All right. So the, the American Westminster basically, so I'll say this, all the squish, all the PCA squish ministers out there are, if they've subscribed to the Westminster Confession of Faith, the American one, they are advocates of Christian nationalism. Because there it says expressly that the magistrate is to be supportive of the church. He doesn't establish any one of them. He's even-handed with all the churches of our common Lord. So the, uh, the, the founders were dealing with maybe a, 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 a handful of Jews. The, probably the biggest problematic group was the Quakers and maybe the Roman Catholics. So they were, they were dealing with an overwhelmingly Protestant and evangelical population. And they said, this is what we want the magistrate to do, to be even-handed among Christians. If you try to absolutize that and say, no, you've got to be even-handed among every religious conviction, whatever, uh, then now you've got Islamic fundamentalists and jihadists, and you know, uh, it just is not workable. So I think, I think we have to come back to a mere Christendom approach, and I believe the American Presbyterians uh, hammered out a way for Baptists to be comfortable with this kind of recognition that Jesus is Lord of all things, including the public square. So uh, when does uh, when do you think that uh, book will be out? Because I'm really interested in seeing. The, 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 you know, uh, Bonson said years and years and years ago. Well, he had to have said it years and years and years ago because he's gone. But um, he uh, he said there's still a lot of work to be done in mapping out. Um, theonomy and how God's law is a- applicable and how we do general equity and all. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done, and and I, w- I would agree with him. There's that's that's very very true, and obviously there would be a tremendous amount of work that would have to be done in the establishment of Christian nationalism. And I'm really repulsed, to be honest with you, by some of the MAGA crowd and the obvious disengagement from any kind of Christian worldview uh, that is right. that is a part of it, and that's that's problematic. But it seems to me that the only way to promote this in a positive fashion is with the realization that comes with postmillennialism, and that is that God has the power and capacity by His Spirit to bring massive um, regeneration uh, and and revival and fulfill those promises of the. The nations streaming to uh, uh, to to Jerusalem and and desiring God's law and things like that. Outside Amen. of that kind of change, I just it does not seem like the mechanics could ever 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 work unless you That's have absolute. people who are focused upon the lordship of Christ and their own self denial. Yeah, you you can't make a good omelet with rotten eggs, and 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 so it doesn't matter if your if your theology is proper. If your recipes are good, the the kitchen is immaculate. You've got the best pots and pans in the world, the best chef in the world. You bring Stephen Wolf in to be the chef, you know, making this omelet. But all he has is pot smoking, unregenerate fornicators. You're not going to be able to build anything worthwhile. It you you can't impose you can't impose a godly system. You can restrain. You can restrain them from as much evil as they were going to commit. But you can't build a godly civil order without a movement of the Spirit of God. But fortunately, uh, and this is something, a point I wanted to make earlier, uh, God has done this before. There have been great awakenings before. And uh, and when we point to, to uh, baptized infidel Europe today, we have to realize that the medieval Europe 
was a basket case, spiritually speaking. They weren't an infidel Europe, but they were superstitious Europe. They were a works-oriented Europe. They were suffocating under the heavy uh, soaked blankets of works, 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 works. And uh, the all of Europe was that way. And the Reformation uh, was post Tenebras Lux, after, after darkness, light. And that was the kind of thing that I think we need today, only I think we need it on a much larger scale because there are so many more of us. That we're dealing with billions of people now, and they were dealing with millions of people then. But, but God has done it before. God knows how to bear his right arm. Well, it seems to me, and we're, we're pretty much out of time, but it seems to me that um, the, uh, the tenebrous um, may get really deep before the lux breaks through, and, and, yeah. and maybe it is the, the utter collapse of the, the secular nonsense we we just every day you you wake up and go oh they found a way to dig deeper astonishing i have never <laughs> never even thought of it but that's exactly that's what right. they're doing it, it it it's how i feel each day and part of me is like yeah this will only hasten its eventual demise but then the other part yeah. of me looks at my grandkids and goes man are they going to are they going to be facing some challenges that that we never faced when in, in our, in our lifetimes. Um, That's and, and so have we provided them with true. the proper foundation, uh, is, is really the question that we have. So, so I'm Amen. looking, I'm Amen. looking, I'm looking forward to, uh, to that book. Uh, and, uh, then we can, we'll obviously get to have a chat about that Lord willing, if, yeah. uh, if there's still electricity in the United States at that point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. So. All right. Well, James, uh, hey, uh, uh, Doug, please, you. please stay, uh, stay away from fire uh, for for a little while, at least no, till next November. That's how that's how we stay. That's how we stay warm up here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true, <laughs> but there are limits. So, anyways, uh, God bless you, brother. We'll yeah, see you, you next yeah. time. All right, you too. Bye.